Life is a journey. Where are you headed? Picture this. You feel perfectly fine, but you go to a doctor anyway just for a checkup. After his time with you, he comes out and he tells you that you have a terminal illness. There is no cure. There will be no major symptoms until the end. And you have one year to live. It's kind of like what Peter's been going through. How would you change your life if you heard that news? You're going to die in eight months. What difference would you make in your life? What plans would you change? What people would you forgive? How would you spend that remaining year of your life? The degree to which you would change your plans is the distance between your current view of life and the biblical view of life. Most people, when they hear news like that, do change things. Priorities seem to fall into place. Whatever worldview you currently live by gets changed into a biblical worldview. See, the biblical worldview sees life on this earth as a journey. All of the stresses, all of the urgencies of time, they're all brief. Actually, they're all very brief. They're all temporary. But they have lasting consequences for where you spend eternity for your punishments and your rewards. Most people see life on this earth as all there is. It is temporary. Even as Christians, we may talk about eternity, but too often we don't live that way. We keep pushing death off into the future. We seem to think that life on this earth will go on forever. Eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you may die. We live as though this is all there is. As we get older, we may realize that now, there might be a little bit more to life. But for the younger ones, it's like, there's no end. I can do whatever I want. This is all there is and all there is ever going to be. Psalm 90, verses 10 and 12. The length of our days is 70 years, or 80, if we have enough strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We may live 70 years, maybe 80. Some people are living to be 100. Seems like a long life. But it says they quickly pass. Psalm 39, verses 4 through 7. Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. Man is a mere phantom as he goes to and fro. He bustles about but only in vain. He heaps up wealth, not knowing who will get it. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. In James 4.14, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. We can make plans for tomorrow. But there's no guarantee that tomorrow's ever going to come for you, for any of us. This life on earth, no matter how important we want it to be, is just a drop of rain in the vast oceans of the world. This earthly life leads to eternity. The moment we are conceived, our eternal life begins. Once this body passes away, your spirit, your soul, will live forever. Life is a journey. Where are you headed? Now, in taking this view, the life on this earth is brief, and we all die. It may seem pessimistic and morbid, but in reality, it isn't. It is realistic, and it is hopeful. 
Realistic because it is better to know things as they are than to believe things as they seem to be or we want them to be but aren't. George Bernard Shaw once said, the statistics on death are impressive. One out of one dies. It is appointed for each one of us to die unless Yeshua returns before our physical death. Taking this point of view is hopeful. Because it informs us that there is more to life than what we presently see and what we're presently going through. It assures us that this longing for more than what this world has to offer is not merely a dream. God's invitation to us is not only for forgiveness, but also for newness of life in Christ. We go through this life on earth and we know there's something out there. We want more. We just don't know what it is until we have this newness of life in Christ. Then we know. There are basically three dominant worldviews. Now, a worldview is how you see life working out and how you live things. Not just how you think about things. That's your paradigm. We'll talk about paradigms in a little bit. This uh, worldview determines what your decisions are based on, your bias, which eventually determines how you live your life. Your worldview is what dictates the things you do, your, the decisions you do make. Now the first one claims that ultimate reality is material, that everything in this universe is impersonal, is the impersonal product of time and chance. Sounds like evolution. That's where evolution gets its foundation, or it gets its foundation from evolution. There are various views to this, this thought of the material world. It's best known as naturalism, or atheism, or even humanism. The physical is all that there is, and after death, that's it. Life ceases. The second worldview claims that ultimate reality is not material, but spiritual. However, this spiritual agent is not a personal being, but the all that there is. You might even go so far as to classify it as the force from Star Wars. There are also variations on this worldview, including monism, pantheism, transcendentalism, and the New Age movement. And the third one distinguishes between the creation and the creator, declares that ultimate reality is an infinite, intelligent, and personal being. We call this theism, belief that there is a God, and it has all kinds of variations. Uh, ours is what we call the Christian worldview. It affirms that this being is our personal God. God who has decisively revealed himself in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Only the third worldview offers genuine hope beyond the grave. The first predicts annihilation, the material views. Annihilation, the cessation of life. Once the material dies, there is no more. While well, the second leads to reincarnation, which is saying that material existence is just part of a cycle of change. This is actually a spiritual version of annihilation. You just don't disappear. Your spirit gets recycled, just like the garbage. But the Bible teaches resurrection. Resurrection into a new existence, a new life, love in heaven, characterized by intimacy with our Lord and with one another or of eternal punishment in hell, separated from all that is good. So you get heaven or you get hell. Everything we go through now is preparing us for existence after our physical death. God does not build a staircase to nowhere. To nowhere. You get to choose which staircase you want to walk on. We get caught up in one of the two paradigms, temporal or eternal. This determines our thing. The worldview determines that the paradigm is how you are actually seeing, how you are living it. Your paradigm is how you understand things and make decisions. Annihilation and reincarnation are temporal paradigms. Resurrection is an eternal paradigm. Annihilation and uh, reincarnation both lead to nothing. Resurrection leads to an eternal life. Sometimes you back, bounce back and forth between these two, between the temporal and the eternal. We can live in this world as though this is all there is. Get caught up 
in all the hustle and bustle of daily living, forgetting about eternity. Or we could view our earthly existence as a brief journey designed to prepare us for eternity. And even as Christians, we know in our head that it's eternal. But in our daily living, sometimes we live as though it's temporary, just temporary. Take some time to read Hebrews 11 and see how those men and women viewed their journey on this earth. Hebrews 11.13 says, All these died in faith without receiving the promise. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, they understood that they were on a journey to receive God's promises, but that they may not see them while on this side, while on earth. They may have to wait for eternity, but they had enough faith in God that they followed Him anyway, even if they did not get to see the end result. The major problem is that we have been captured by the temporal paradigm because we live in a temporary world. We live in our senses, our feelings, the things that we can touch and see and hear. And so that's where we, we choose to live. And that is all temporary. It takes great risk and courage and strength to shift your view to a biblical worldview. Because the biblical pattern of life challenges everything that our culture reinforces. What the Bible teaches runs contrary to almost everything that our culture teaches. To be conformed to the image of Christ, this is what we are to be doing. <clears throat> Romans 12, 2. In other words, do not let yourselves be conformed to the standards of the Olam Hazat of this world. Instead, keep letting yourselves be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you will know what God wants and will agree that, he, that what He wants is good, satisfying, and able to succeed. So do not let yourselves be conformed to this world, to this culture. Instead, keep letting yourself. It's a constant process. It doesn't happen just once and by magic you're changed. We live in this. It is a process that we have to keep renewing. And when we do that, we will learn what God wants for us. What is good, satisfying, and able to succeed. See, the more we have invested in the culture, in the current cultural paradigm, the better we are functioning within it, the more we may feel we will lose by changing to a biblical paradigm. In other words, the more we accept what the world says is right, the more we think we're going to lose if we change and follow what the Bible teaches. It's backwards. Only when we renew our mind with biblical truth and reinforce this truth through relationships with other children of the kingdom do we begin to see that we are on a brief journey. That our life here on earth will have an end. When we see this, we discover that we must pursue the things that will last throughout eternity rather than the things that are passing away. This is our responsibility, something we must make up our mind to do. You make the choice. You must discipline yourself. The problem is that the change from temporal to eternal is reversible. We make this decision, we want to follow Christ. We realize that this life on earth is not all there is, that it will end, and we want this eternal life. But as we live our life on earth, we get caught up in the daily busyness of our lives. And we flip-flop between these two opposing worldviews at a moment's notice. Because we live in this world and a fleshly body with all of its weaknesses and emotions, sometimes we just get tired of the fight and give in. And this struggle will go on until the day we die. Though the time spent in the temporal, in the temporary, becomes less and less as we grow in the spiritual. The more we learn about what the Bible teaches, the less we will spend in this cultural concept of what the world teaches. It will not happen automatically. It is not magic. It takes work. It takes effort on our part. 
God will help us do that. He will help us through it. But we must first want it. A.W. Tozer wrote, How completely satisfying to turn from our limitations to a God who has none. Eternal years lie in his heart. For him, time does not pass. It remains. And those who are in Christ share with him all the riches of limitless time and endless years. As I see it, actually, eternity has no years. Eternity has no time. Because God created time for us. God is outside of time. But it's a good explanation. It helps us to get a, a, an idea of what we talk about. We talk about eternity. It's one of these concepts that has no beginning and has no ending. We don't understand that. But as Tozer wrote, uh, eternal years lies in his heart. For him, time does not pass. It remains. It stands still. Uh, those who are in Christ share with him all the riches of limitless time and endless years. It gives us a perspective at which to look at eternity so that we can then look at what we have here on earth and realize this is temporary. <coughs> 60, 70, 80, 100 years seems like a long time. But not when you realize that our life goes on and on and on. Eternal. No ending. 1 John 2, 15-17 Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Some hard words. <clears throat> if you're going to love what's in the world, you cannot love the Father. Which means if you're going to love God, if you're going to give Him your life and follow after Him, you cannot be totally involved in the world, in the culture, and all the stuff that goes on here. James 4.4, 4, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. If you want to value the things of the world more than you value the things of God, you cannot be God's friend. You become His enemy. He says that. Luke 16, 15. That which is highly valued among men is detestable in the sight of God. Strong words and we feel full to ignore them. As Augustine wrote, we must care for our bodies as though we were going to live forever, but we must care for our souls as if we were going to die tomorrow. This is what we live in. This is the struggle that we live in. We understand the eternal. We understand what this is saying. But living it is another story. Because we live in our emotions. We live in the flesh. But that does not control us. The Holy Spirit, as a Christian, the Holy Spirit should control us. The more we feed ourselves from God, the less the world will have control of us. Does this, not, does this mean that we become so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good? In fact, the opposite is true. When people become heavenly minded, they treasure the passing opportunities of this life and become more alive to the present moment. When you know that this time on earth is so brief and that eternity is so long, you realize that the things that happen on this earth, you have an input in. Leading other people to God. Living your life in order to, to show where you're spending eternity. Rather than being overwhelmed with the problems of daily living, you understand that these too shall pass away. Romans 8, 18. I consider that our present suffering, sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul's talking. Whatever, and you, read, you read the scripture, you know what Paul went through. The times he spent in prison, the beatings. He was stoned to death once and brought back to life. And he says that all these troubles of the world are nothing compared to the glory that I'm going to receive when I go to be with the Father. We are on a journey. Where are we headed? 
Instead of wasting time as though we had a million years to live on earth, we would do well to remember the Apostle's exhortation in Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. Be most careful then how you conduct yourselves, how you live your lives. Like sensible men, not like simpletons. Use the present opportunity to the full, for these are evil days. So do not be fools, but try to understand what the will of the Lord is. As you live your life each and every day, don't be a simpleton. Don't just go along with the world. Learn what the Bible teaches. Live it that way. Use the present opportunity to the full. What God brings into your life, use it for your life and for those around you. As you conform to the image of Christ, are you following his journey down the narrow path? Or are, are you making your own way down the broad road that leads to destruction? There is an end coming. Not just the end of your physical life, but the end of almost all that exists. Revelation tells us that God has created, that all things God has created will be destroyed. But that he is also going to recreate things. I was watching a uh, they get a new series on uh, History Channel. And I don't watch History Channel too much, but I wanted to watch this one. It's ten ways that the world could could end. Last night was the second way. Really interesting. Talk about a black hole. <coughs> what would happen if the Earth went through a black hole? Because black holes move. And if this black hole came, how it would just suck the life out of the Earth. All Human life, animal life, plant life. It would just pull the earth apart. And it was in the description. It was interesting because in reading scripture, it tells us that God is going to destroy all that exists down to the very atom. And as they were discussing what a black hole would do to the earth and how it would just begin to pull it apart, it would pull the dirt apart. And then it would get down to where it would pull the molecules apart, clear down to where it would pull the atoms apart. I'm not saying that's how God's going to destroy everything, but what's interesting is that science can prove what God has already said, if that's what he wants to use. That that is a possible way. That everything is going to be destroyed. But there is something that will live forever. You. Not your body, the one you have now. Every person is going to be raised again with a body that will live forever. Now this kind of goes a little contrary to what we assume the Bible says when it talks about eternal life and eternal death. Eternal death is a concept, when it, when it was written, it was a good concept, knowing that you were going to be separated from God for, forever. But when we think of eternal death, it leads us back to the annihilation, the cessation of life. Death is no more life. But it's actually an eternal life in death. An eternal life in hell that will live forever. And God's description of hell is not a very pleasing place. But TV the other day, there was a, a clip of some of the, it wasn't necessarily a riot, I can't remember exactly what it was, something like down in New Orleans and all that stuff. But, uh, there was one sign that says, uh, I'm going to have a party in hell. And just stuff like this. You will not have a party in hell. It is a place of torment. It is a place of punishment. Scripture defines it as a place where the worm never dies. In other words, your body will not decompose. It is a place of eternal fire. A place where, you know what it feels like to get burned. Imagine that for eternity. That is the punishment of hell. The total absence of anything good because God will not be there. Now eternal life is being in the presence of God. To be one of his children. Scripture tells us that when we become a Christian, we become heirs of everything that God has. We, all of his being is available to us. All of the good that you can think of is available to us. 
Life is a journey. Where are you headed? That is your journey.